Do you know what a lube chip is? A lube chip. No. no. Lube chips. For years, I've had a sign out on an aid station that says help prevent the spread of lube chips. And lube chips are when um, somebody comes into the aid station, they dive their meaty little fist into the Vaseline jar or whatever, and then they rub them all, rub that all over their nether bits and their butthole. And then the next thing you know, they take that same hand and dive it into the chip bowl. And now they're eating chips, right? Those are loop chips. Today on the podcast... We have John Lacroix. 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 Even though he pronounces it Lacroix. From the <laughs> Ultra Stories podcast. Which, and the Human Potential Running Series. Yeah. Which so. is Colorado's largest trail series. Mm -hmm. And we're going to talk about everything about how he was able to pull off the impossible, which is having all of his events take place. In 2020. Yes. Yeah. That's interesting. And we're big fans of his podcast, too. So yeah. we like to... He likes to tell it as it is. Tell it as it is. <laughs> All right. Coming up. Welcome, so. to, welcome to Canada. <laughs> hey. Do you have a drink? What do you got there? La Bablu? No, we have <laughs> some maple syrup, whiskey, uh, coffee, and cocoa. <laughs> that sounds good. What have you got? Nothing. It's still early here. That's right. We're past 12, so we're allowed. <laughs> yeah. No, it's not noon here. It's noon somewhere, but not here. <laughs> so we just wanted to give you uh, a little lesson in how to pronounce your name properly. <laughs> oh, it's Lacroix. My way, My yeah. Way. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's Jean-Paul Lacroix. Right. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, my middle name is Paul, and so my my name is, as I understand it, is is legitimately John Paul of the Cross. That's right. That's right. Yeah, so it doesn't get any more Catholic than that. <laughs> no, it sure doesn't. <laughs> but you have a little bit of Canadian background, do you not? You know, my um, my f grandparents, I believe, on my father's side, came over to the United States from French Canada, from from uh, Quebec. To, to work in the mills uh, in the Northeast, uh, making textiles. Wow. Wow. So that's how Yeah, you, yeah. So they, they went there, they got down to uh, Virginia? Is that where you grew up, Virginia? No, I grew up in New Hampshire. Oh, okay. And so I used to actually frequent uh, Montreal quite a bit. Um, <laughs> Montreal, I love it. <laughs> yeah, I, I, uh, I actually went to college for a year in northern Vermont. Uh, mm. uh, in a uh, place called Linden State, um, and and so Montreal was was only a, a, a half hour or hour away from uh, from Burlington, I believe. Um, so yeah, we we used to cross the border because all the stuff that's illegal in the U.S. until you're 21 <laughs> is legal at 18 up there. That's uh, right. So I'd go to Sherbrooke and Montreal and uh, many a night at Cafe Campus near McGill University. Um, yeah, yeah. I had, I had my fun in Canada. That's right. <laughs> Very good. So officially you're the race director of human potential running series and the ultra stories podcast. And your claim to fame at the moment is that you're the only race director on the continent <laughs> to have completed all of your races in one format or another in 2020. That's right. We had zero cancellations. I, I ended up having to move a few, but we held them. And so, yeah, as, as far as we know, we're the only major race series in the world to, uh, to be able to have accomplished that in 2020. Yeah. So I, I'm going to hang on to that as long as I possibly can. As you should. Definitely. You should be promoting that because uh, <laughs> up here in Canada, it was very difficult. I don't think anything actually went off. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. Yeah, yeah it, it was a very different set of circumstances. But, uh, <clears throat> but we want to kind of go back to your grassroots and how you became an ultra runner and then transitioned into actually putting on events yourself. So if you could just give us a little bit of that background. We're pretty familiar with your history through your podcast, but for our listeners up here who haven't yeah. been introduced to you yet, if you could, please. For, for our three listeners. <laughs> 
<laughs> It'll grow, man. It's a slow grind. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, you know, um, in 2004, I was making a documentary film about peak bagging New Hampshire's White Mountains. There's 48 mountains over 4,000 feet in elevation. And I wondered if anybody had done them the fastest. Uh, and I figured that, man, if somebody had done it the fastest, it must have taken them three months. And after a little bit of research, I discovered that the record was actually just shy of three days. <laughs> and it, it, it blew my mind that somebody could run 167 miles, 64,000 feet of climbing. That's the equivalent of from sea level to the top of Everest twice in less than three days. And so I interviewed some of these guys uh, who had set the record at, at one time or another and asked them, they started talking about this ultra running thing. I'd never heard the the phrase before, the term. I was really interested in adventure racing at the time. I never actually did one. But, um, <laughs> you know, I asked them, what, what do you have to do to be an ultra marathon runner? And none of them mentioned running. They all said you, you need to be stubborn and able to put up with discomfort. I was like, well, I've got that in spades. So uh, I decided uh, through making that documentary film that I was going to become an ultra marathon runner. And I was all of 23 years old. And a lot of time has passed since then. But uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's essentially how I got into the sport. Uh, I just started researching. Uh, started running and started with literally learning how to run a mile. I think you and I started at the same time, 2005 about. Was that? Yeah. Yeah. I think. And I'm it right. seems like eons ago. It does. Because my first ultra was the Can Canadian death race back in 2005. I think That's it was. Right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. That's so, a bucket list race. Mine, <laughs> by the way. Is it? Yeah. It is. has to be done one day. Absolutely. Yeah. When I, how I, got to know you basically or learned about you is that Jody said, Hey, you should start listening to some podcasts. And I said, so I went around from different podcasts here and there. And then I came across yours. And the first thing that uh, the first podcast I heard about you is how much um, people don't give a shit about your ultra sign up ranking. <laughs> yes. They know that, nobody that is gives what, a flip. That is what intrigued me about, okay, I got to listen to this guy. <laughs> <laughs> it's, you know, it's, it's so true though. Um, as a race director, as a race director, you entertain any number of emails uh, heading into race week and after race week. And what really started to annoy me <laughs> was the sheer number of emails that I received from runners who were like, could you remove me from the roster so that I don't show up as a DNS man? Cause that just looks really bad. Wow. And in my world, it's who the F do you think? That's okay. You can curse here. Okay. <laughs> who the fuck do you think is going through to see who all the DNSs are? And then when they notice your name on there, they're like, Oh man, that's a bad look for him. Like nobody cares yeah, at nobody all. Cares. No. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I used to be friends with Mark, the uh, Mark Gilligan, the owner of Ultra Sign Up. And, and he had confided in me at, at one point or another that the ranking that they created was just to have a little bit of fun. It's not anything official. It's not uh, esteemed in mathematics. It includes your every result since you started running ultras. And so my Ultra Sign Up ranking is all of my running for the last 15 years. That is not, I, I assure you, that is not an accurate representation of who I am as an ultra runner right now. Um, but yeah, like people start like getting, they're so, these type A people that we cater to, mm -hmm. they're so obsessed with the with these numbers that their, their ranking matters. And so you've got to get their time just right. You've got to get the place they finished in absolutely just right. You've got to... Um, make sure that uh, you know people think like your DNF actually has some sway in the algorithm, and it doesn't. They think that the DNS has a sway in the algorithm, and it doesn't. It's only your finishes. But the number of emails that I get from people that want me, the race director, when I've got a thousand other things to do, <laughs> the very last thing that I personally care about 
is is your ultra sign up? Well, we are race directors ourselves. Not as many races as you have, but um, just something else that comes up as far as our race directing events is when some elite guy comes out of nowhere and gives us an email saying, "Hey, I'm a fast runner. I should. Can you give me a free entry?" And I'll take all your swag and everything else for free as well. What do you do in that situation as a race director? <laughs> you yeah. guys are getting all the good points. You got to get a drink now. I, I got one of these the other day, actually, before our last race of the year. I've been training so hard. I really want to run your race. I'm an elite runner. Here's my running resume. And it's for me, it's like, Oh shit! I didn't know we were applying for a job here at <laughs> Tiffany's. You know, I I thought we were just running. Um, I don't even open them. I I do not even open the resume. I don't care. Uh, I specifically have on our website um, a section where you can learn about getting discounted entries and how we do that. And on there it says specifically that we don't cater to the, the elite. Um, you know, I, I, I really believe that the, the single mom of three uh, has to sacrifice more and train just as hard to be able to maybe barely finish the damn race. Yeah. That those are the people who deserve the comp entry. Right. Not just some guy because you are genetically gifted and, and really talented and choosing to live in a van down by the river <laughs> so that you can train shirtless for, you know who I'm talking about. <laughs> you know, like, but, but why am I have gonna, long hair too? Yeah. Like, why am I going <laughs> to, why, why am I going to cater to them? Like why? And, and so, you know, normally my response is something like, you know, uh, if you actually, if you come out and volunteer, you will earn race credits to put towards an entry. And we pay, I pay like $10 an hour in race credits for every hour worked. And if you're overnight or like between 10 p.m. and 6 a.m., it's $20 an hour. If you do course marking, it's $20 an hour. So it's one of those like you could come out Friday and course mark with us uh, and then you'll run for free the next day. Really? Uh, and nine and a half times out of actually no, it's ten out of ten. Literally zero of those elite runners actually volunteer. They just give me the oh, never mind, man. You know. <laughs> I think that's part of it though, is that some RDs in the sport here stateside decided that prize money was a good idea. Mm. And that was gonna be the way that we grow the sport. And I mean, totally, they're like, this is the way we're going to grow ultra running. We're going to offer this prize money. And it's just, dude, nobody cares about that. There's less than 1% of the field even has a chance of winning that. And so I really believe that embracing the roots of ultra running, which is a focus on community mm -hmm. and treating everybody the same uh, and celebrating everybody as equal, uh, that's what's important, not injecting this waste of prize money like imagine if you took 10 grand and instead of giving it to the per the top three you uh got some better swag for your runners yeah. or you put more yeah. food out at the aid station and you took care of everybody instead of three people exactly yeah that's a good point so should we go into COVID, or did you want to ask a bit more about his history because well, i i have so many COVID questions <laughs> Just the fact that we couldn't put on any of our races this year because of COVID, but the fact you did is why we're reaching out and saying, hey, how did this happen? But before that, um, there's one other thing I wanted to ask you about one of your podcasts that I heard was, was when you first started running, you had all these questions to this elite woman runner. I don't know if you yeah. remember that. Yeah, okay. I do. Yeah, I'll never and forget she, it. And when you asked her all these questions, as you were running beside her, she decided not to answer any of them. Not a single one. Now, I'm curious to know any follow-up on that. Did she finally answer any of those questions? No, but um, <laughs> I think it was 2008 or nine. We both ran in the Vermont 50-mile endurance run. And once I knew she was there, it was on. And <laughs> to this day, that is my 50-mile, official 50-mile PR, 858. <laughs> nice. And I... And when when I beat her, I beat her ass. Wow! And when Excellent. she came, in, when she came into the finish line, 15, 20 minutes later, the first thing she said was to me, and she said, 
The only reason you ran that fast is because I'm here. And I said, <laughs> yep. Yep. <laughs> and, uh, and so we got a picture. We, we took a picture together. So I have a picture of her and I at the finish line side by wow. side. And you know what? That's, that's actually one of those pictures that, that I hang up to. That's motivation for me. The, the sheer number of people, and you know this as ultra runners, the number of people in our lives who tell you you shouldn't, you couldn't, you won't, you can't, et cetera. Um, man, if I had a middle finger for each of them, I'd never wear gloves again. <laughs> um, yeah, I just, what a cool moment. Okay, so let's get into... Let's your, get into 2020? Yeah, yeah, let's get into your adaption, adapting to COVID. Right, so... Let's do it. <laughs> so, um, like you said, you've managed to put on every race in your series this year. How many races do you have, sorry? Oh, we have 11 events. 11 events. 10 in Colorado and one in Arkansas? Yes. Correct. And you just finished your last race last weekend, right? So That's right, yeah, on the 12th of December. What, what percentage of finishers did you have this year versus last? Uh, uh, that's an interesting question. Yeah. <laughs> A lot of people showed up underprepared this year, mm. but our finishing numbers are no different than they've always been. So your restrictions on terms of gatherings were not as strict as ours, I would assume, because that was what our challenge was. I actually didn't run into an issue with gathering size until my last race. Every um, My August race was the largest event I've ever directed. And what race was uh, that? Uh, Sheep Mountain Endurance Runs. Mm -hmm. I moved my June... South Park Trail Marathon and half to the same weekend. Mm -hmm. And so between those two events combined, we had the most people we've ever had at an event. Wow. Um, and then in September, we followed it up with the Sangre de Cristo Ultras. And that was just one event without another one attached onto it. Mm -hmm. And it ended up being the largest single event that we've ever had as well. We had close to 300. Really, the only thing that's different is you're you're attaching a COVID plan onto your normal permit application, and so it's here's what I would normally send you, and here's our plan for COVID nineteen. Mm. And at this point, it's a copy and paste. Like you could copy from. I'll give you mine. It's, it's, <laughs> I, like, I'd love to see it. <laughs> I haven't. I haven't reinvent. I didn't reinvent anything really. Mm. I mean. Uh, it, it's just a collection of what the CDC and, and uh, here in the U.S., the CDC and, and what others had, had already extrapolated was going to be the new reality. And mm -hmm. so you just take all those bits of information, organize it. You, you cannot guarantee anybody's health or safety at one of these events before right. COVID, during COVID, or after COVID. I can't guarantee that you're safe or you're going to remain healthy. Mm -hmm. So the, these COVID-19 protocols – literally are uh, the race director creating the illusion of safety. Mm. You're just showing a land manager or the health department that COVID's on your purview, that's in your mind. You've got some kind of plan in place to keep people socially distant and safe, but you can't guarantee that. And so, so again, it's, you're creating this illusion. Right. We did, we did virtual, uh, virtual pre-race meetings. Nice. which are staying forever. I love that. Yeah. Um, I'm not tired at pre-race meeting and punchy. Like I'm rested and ready to go before the race week gets crazy. We're just given that meeting. Um, we also did um, temperature checks at check-in. Um, and I just did 100 degrees. You got to be below 100 degrees mm. and Fahrenheit. Uh, and some people are like, uh, it's got to be 100.4. Like, what's the point four matter? And, and, you know, again, like, if you have a fever, that doesn't mean you have COVID. And if you don't have a fever, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that you don't have COVID. Exactly. And so here we are implementing these temperature checks. Like, this is, again, we're creating the illusion that we're, it doesn't, it's like the ultra sign up ranking. This doesn't make any sense, but this is what you have to do 
to do your due diligence so that if anything were to happen and you find yourself in court, you could display to the court, look, I followed all the guidelines that the CDC says that we should follow right. uh, to keep people distant and safe. You know, the, what's really the hardest part is getting people to follow through, yes. uh, especially here stateside when we are so polarized. Uh, I call it bipolarized. Um, <laughs> we just argue about everything. And... <laughs> wearing a mask or not wearing a mask is COVID a hoax or is it not a hoax is <laughs> am i getting a stimulus check or am i not getting a stimulus check and it's just on and on and on and at the end of the day like you know people just love to play games with the semantics of things you tell them to wear a mask and they put it on their risk on their wrist and they're like see i'm wearing it and it's like <laughs> not actually Never. what i was talking about douchebag like <laughs> come on you know and so, yeah, that's the hardest thing is getting people to follow through and just getting through their skulls that, look, I don't care what your political beliefs are or your, your conspiracy theories. I don't care about any of that. These are the conditions of our permit. And right. so this is what you're going to do to be able to run. And if you don't do this, you're done running here literally forever Yeah. because you're jeopardizing our permit. Um, and it's worked out well. So... Did you make any big changes to your aid stations? Because that was one thing that, you know, kind yes. of going through, I was a little concerned about. <laughs> you know what a lube chip is? A lube chip. No. no. Lube chips. For years, I've had a sign out on an aid station that says, to help prevent the spread of lube chips. And lube chips are when um, somebody comes into the aid station, they dive their meaty little fist into the Vaseline jar or whatever, and then they rub them all, rub that all over their nether bits and their butthole. And then the next thing you know, they take that same hand and dive it into the chip bowl. And now they're eating chips, right? Those are loop chips. And you, know, you really got to pay attention to like, I don't think people realize how common a thing that is. That's trail like, running. <laughs> oh. So, so we chair AIDS stations to kind of be like these short order stations mm -hmm. so as a, as a runner comes into the station they can't touch anything and so they can't touch a water cooler i got volunteers pouring water by a pitcher okay uh, into their bladder or bottle or whatever and the volunteers can't touch their bottle it's no touch you hold it out like um but if you want some food you just tell the volunteer what you want and they'll give it to you with a pair of tongs mm. and so we use tongs to pick up the chippies and we put it out in your little hand and your loop chips didn't touch a thing. And you know, the, the common thing that I'm hearing from runners about that, uh, that fix is this is long overdue for a long, <laughs> for a very long time. Ultra running aid stations have been the least hygienic place I've ever been. Yeah. And I, you know, you hear stories of people getting sick at races and they have no idea why. Uh, I know why. You know, you're, <laughs> the yeah. Shit's disgusting. Like yes. you got something at the race, and so finally we have some hygiene uh, and some some food safety that's uh, long overdue uh, at ultra events, and so it's worked out really well. And and I don't know if that'll stay or not. I hope it does, but it's working out pretty well to uh, prevent the spread of lube chips. But because <laughs> so we're doing the wave starts and. You know, a lot of people are like, oh, you got to do wave starts based on their ultra sign-up ranking uh, so that all the fast kids can run with the fast kids. And, you know, yeah, that sounds great and all if you care about the race. But at the end of the day, if I've got fast kids and slow kids all in the same wave, I'm spreading my field out. And by the mm -hmm. time anybody gets, you know, you know, they get 10K in and they get to that first aid station, they're so far spread out that there are no lines uh, at the aid stations. It's worked out really well. Right. I, I keep everything on. I keep the the uh, this inflatable here. <laughs> man, I, I should, I should, this is why I didn't become a weatherman. This thing stays <laughs> up until the fi very final runner comes through the finish line. Yes. Thank you. That's yeah. a good uh, that. Thank is the oh, best thing. We, well, we had to tell him about last year. Yeah. So we went to a race. Uh, well, you'll know it. Mozart 100 in Salzburg. And finish line. It was in the main square. Beer tent. 
music stage, vendors. It was a party. I did a shorter event, so I finished in the middle of the day. It was like it was like Oktoberfest. It was awesome. Norm mm -hmm. was doing the hundred. Yeah. And he's I'm two or three hours before the, the last runner, so I have plenty of time to finish this race. But basically, they were tearing everything down while I was coming through. And I'm thinking, well, wait a minute. Hate that. There's three, there's three hours to go. <laughs> there yeah, was so no food. There was no food. There was nowhere to sit. They'd taken all the, the, the tables and chairs away. Literally, all I could hand them was a beer. We had to go to the McDonald's that was open till 3 a.m. Like, that's the last well, that's thing you right. want when you're not in Salzburg. <laughs> <laughs> it's not real meat there. <laughs> it was just. I didn't say that, perfect. but it's all right. <laughs> <laughs> and you know what? If the truth be told, this is why we got into race directing. Because all those little things that we noticed when going to races that make such a huge difference. Yeah that people just don't take the time to fix. It's, it's the little things that count. It makes such a big difference to the experience. Well, you, what you're learning is you're learning who the race directors are that really don't give a shit. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if you became a race director and you cannot keep your finish line up and the grill on for the last runner, why did you become a race director? Obviously, it was just to make money and go home. Mm-hmm. Um, but if, if you're really a race director for the right reasons and you're invested in the community and the people who are there and you appreciate every single runner who contributed to the finances of that event to make it happen, you're going to leave it all up and ready and waiting for that last runner. And yeah. then you pack it up and go home. I went to the Western States 100 website last week and just – the emotion that drummed up inside of me by just going to their website. Uh, I need to keep going there because it made me want to run again so I can get back to Western States. Um, yeah. Speaking you know, of yes. Western States. Oh, well, you have to hear Norm's little pity story. <laughs> Speaking of Western States, I finally got accepted after six years of trying and then COVID hit. So I'm going on seven years of not getting there. But you ran it twice already. Is that right? It, yeah. So Please what advice, what advice yeah. would you give me who hasn't run it yet? <laughs> I got in. What advice would you give me for Western States? How to attack this thing? Western States is probably one of the most fun ultra puzzles I've ever had to put together. <laughs> and it's, it is, it's an expensive race, but they take really good care of you. It is worth every penny. Um, they are very good people. Uh, I love Craig Thornley. When I ran it in 17, I got to run with him. He actually was running in the race. I got to share miles with him and John Fegavarezzi, who's a Barkley finisher. Oh, wow. So that was our little trio for the afternoon in the heat. Cool. And it was just, um, you know, everybody looks at Western States and they, and they see this net downhill. And so naturally you would think that most of your training should be downhill training. And I want to tell you that the uphills at Western States are some of the biggest ass kicker uphills I've ever had to endure. And when you're spending so much time running downhill to be over to switch gears to this bitch of an uphill climb, like you got to do that in your training. I, as I would tell anybody, you need to replicate the, cl the course as closely as you can. I know you guys are in Alberta, right? No, Ontario, even worse. Oh, you're Ontario. <laughs> I, I don't imagine you got a lot of uh, mountains there. None whatsoever. Uh, we, we have a bunny. Yeah. <laughs> you got to pull a tire, man. Like, you got to find a way to do the resistance training because that's the crux of Western states. It's, and, and it's going to be the heat. But when I was there in 17, it was 135 degrees in the canyons. Mm. Uh, it was just ridiculously hot. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's heat training and, and trying as closely as you can to – um, you know, replicate what you're going to be going through with those ups and downs. Absolutely. Yeah, well, sure. I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not getting any younger. <laughs> <laughs> and the other part of the story that he hasn't told you is he also got into Boston for and, the first time this year. For he was. Oh, I'm sorry. To and and he also got into UTMB. 
So this was the trifecta of every race. Jesus, dude, you win the lottery? You like legit <laughs> won the lotteries. I, I tried to time it all for one year. <laughs> and then COVID word. hits. That's horrible. Well, by the time you get to run all three, it'll be 2030, right? I mean, just. Oh, great. <laughs> exactly. <Jeez. laughs> so before we go, um, and we end with a little rapid fire, uh, just ask you 10 fun questions. But before we do that, where can people find you? on the web and what have you got coming up next? Uh, they can find the human potential running series on our website, www.humanpotentialrunning.com. Our podcast is the ultra stories podcast. Uh, you can find that pretty much everywhere. Stitcher, iTunes, tune in radio, Google play music, iHeartRadio, Spotify. I don't know if I said that anyway, um, <laughs> would love to have their, uh, their listenership as well. Um, uh, yeah, and what's next is uh, we're year round. So my next um, my next race is on February sixth, and last year I showed up the day before. There was two feet of snow on the ground that just fell. Uh, so I showed up with my tra trailer and a shovel, <laughs> and the land manager was like, "You're not serious." I'm like, "I'm dead serious." And we dug out an aid station and and had over 200 runners in two feet of snow. It was amazing. So. Wow. Yeah, we're just, uh, I'm going on vacation here next week, uh, well-earned vacation, and then uh, we get back right to it here after the new year. After, uh, for all your events, which one would you recommend for us? Yeah, we want to come and volunteer. And race. And race. So, so which one would give us the best? Experience of. Yeah. Wow, that is a hard <laughs> question. <laughs> Probably Sangre de Cristo ultras in september has become our best weekend of the year that's probably um, good because we have to train six months through the winter so yeah <laughs> yeah september's a good time for us to run or race although that's <laughs> that's where we have our events yeah so when we're <laughs> retired <laughs> yeah you know if, if you're not going to do that i would say uh, um silver heels or sheep mountain uh one of those two weekends in fair play just being up high in beautiful colorado high country is Perfect. It's really cool. That that August race, the wildflowers are out, and it just smells like lavender everywhere that you go. Oh, wow. So um, I, I like to recommend that one too. Sheep Mountain 50 or the 50K. Okay. All right. So just first thing that comes into your mind. You ready? Okay. All right. Got it. Yeah. Split shorts. Yes or no? No. <laughs> <Ew>. Worst. <laughs> what? I imagine you have nice quads if you're a hiker. <laughs> Yeah, but that's a little too close to showing something that doesn't need to be shown. <laughs> On that note, worst place you've chafed? <laughs> oh, definitely my asshole. <laughs> have you lost a toenail? Two. I still have them. What? Sorry, can you say that again? <laughs> you heard that right. <laughs> Two of them, and I still have them. I saved oh. them. Oh. <laughs> In a drink? <laughs> no, they're they're toenails. <laughs> yeah. They're in a drawer uh, in my de <laughs> They're in a drawer in my office. In Alaska, uh, there's a there's a drink where you where you they you drink toenails. <laughs> oh, that's disgusting. As a, side, them. as a sidebar, I lost two both my big toes in a in a whirlpool after a race, and I put them in the top shelf of our display cabinet in our running store, and no one noticed it for about three months. <laughs> And they were gnarly, black, disgusting. They were sitting on my bib from the race. You should have put a price tag beside them. And finally, someone looked down and went. This is one of the most fucked up things I've ever heard. I know, right? <laughs> Literally, he w he looked down and he went. He backed away. He's like, is that your toenail? I'm like, yep. Sold. <laughs> okay. Favorite Gross. curse word. Fuck. Yeah. Pick a superpower. Your, what you oh, would damn. want. I want to fly. Fly? fly. Yeah. First thing yeah, you fly. do at a finish line when you cross. Breathe. <laughs> <laughs> if you could travel back in time, what period would you go to? Oh, the 1800s um, after the Civil War. So when uh, they started pushing west. Nice. Nice. A favorite junk food. Is pizza a junk food? No. That's a food group. That's a fast food. <laughs> Not a junk food. It's I like food your style. Uh, okay. Um, <laughs> Caramellos. What's that? 
<laughs> it must be Donna, American. <laughs> must be. Uh, Caramello. It's um, it's just a chocolate bar with caramel inside. Oh, we don't I, have those. Like a, I, like a Rolo. Oh, okay. okay. Have you heard of um, butter tarts? No. Really? <laughs> wow. It's big yeah. up in here. I didn't know that was Canadian until very recently. Mm -hmm. Um. Okay. So end by saying sorry a in a Canadian accent, which I just sorry, gave. A. <laughs> sorry. A. Say sorry. Sorry. A. Sorry. <laughs> so, so I, I, I again I'm from New Hampshire and uh my my family's French Canadian my my ma mère actually spoke French fluently. Uh, oh. I have no idea as a kid what her and my dad were talking about. I know she was bitching about me, but I have no idea what she said. <laughs> um, but we used to say, I come from the west side of Manchester. I throw my wife down the stairs the kiss. Uh, the next time you go through my yard, you go around. Um, yeah, that's, that's the extent of my French Canadian. Uh, yes. but I, to all those people out there who I just offend, I sorry a. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> well, thank you so much for your time today, John. We really appreciate it. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Thanks for having me, and and good luck on your podcast uh, journey, guys. And uh, you know, I I know you listen to my program. If if you guys need any help, if you need any advice, guidance, you just want to be a part of fellow RDs that bounce ideas off each other. We'd love to have you guys. Um, you sure know, thing. anything we can do to make this, the sport better all around, you know, let's, let's do it. Let's do it together. Awesome. When the world opens up, we'll come down and see yeah, you. Yeah, absolutely. Please do. We will. Okay. Cheers. Merry Christmas. Cheers. <laughs> Happy holidays to you guys. Happy. Is it boxing day? It's boxing we have, day. Uh, we have boxing day the day after Christmas. That's right. Okay. Yeah. Well, happy <laughs> boxing day. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Cheers. Bye. All right, guys. <laughs> Bye. Oh, John Lacroix. I can't roll my R's. <laughs> John Lacroix. There we go. That was awesome. Yeah. I really enjoyed talking to him. He's he's yeah. very honest. If you were to hear his uh, podcast, he basically tells it as it is. and uh, But it comes from a pure place. Like yeah, He really yeah. wants to make this sport everything it can possibly be. Mm -hmm. And we appreciate that because... It's it's a tough business, but it's growing, which is awesome. And uh, I think he has a lot of great insights and things that I think we should adopt in our own style of race directing because you yeah, know, it's a uh, it's always evolving. Yeah, and he's been able to do that really well. Sorry, <laughs> no, it's all good. <laughs> all right. Well, I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah. Don't smash. Tap gently. Yeah, we don't want you to break your keyboard <laughs> on our account. Just like this. Click. Just gently. Done. Tap. Subscribe. Subscribe. Join the family. Like. Support. That's Post it. questions. Norm's desperate <laughs> to answer questions on YouTube. Yes. So please humor us. Ask him a question. Don't ask me a question. Just leave a comment and that'd be fun. Oh, look, we got a comment today. <laughs> woo <laughs> Okay. It's the simple things. Yeah, the simple things be like. See you next time.